Good evening, everyone, and welcome to ACME, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image. We are incredibly excited tonight to have a very, very special guest, or perhaps two, and work with our fr good friends over at Bethesda to be presenting to you launch of Prey. Uh, before I begin, my name's Ari. Um, I work here as a public programs producer, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay respect to their elders past and present, and also to other, any other elders that may be present here in the audience. So I'm sure many of you have been here before, and as you know, ACME is a really unique institution. Uh, we're based here obviously in Melbourne, and we are proud to champion the moving image in all of its forms. Uh, we have over 1.4 million visitors here annually, and we are the world's largest uh, and most visited um, moving image museum. Uh, we're especially proud to be supporting games and gaming related culture here in Melbourne and to be championing it. Um, so we provide support and, um, and promotion for developers and publishers right from the huge AAA level like we're doing this evening, right down to small independent games producers and publishers and developers. Um, as you may know, we have a recently redeveloped games lab with something else to be coming up excitingly this week. And um, we'd like to continue to see here at four games events in the future at ACME. So again, we're extremely excited to be presenting this opportunity to have a discussion with a heavyweight of the gaming industry um, from a fantastic AAA um, publisher and developer. So thanks to our friends at Bethesda, and I'd like to hear a huge round of applause for our guest for this evening, Raphael Colantonio from Arcane Studios. Uh, Raphael is the president and co-creative director of Arcane Studios, where he works alongside Harvey Smith, who is also the co-creative director. Uh, he's been responsible for leading the development of numerous uh, iconic AAA games, including Prey and 2012 Game of the Year Dishonored. Uh, Raphael founded the company back in 1999 in Lyon, France, and expanded to Austin, Texas in 2005. I'd also like to introduce you, please, to our guest panellists for this evening. Our first panelist is Alexander Musket. Alex uh, is a game designer who loves to make unusual places to explore. He teaches game design at RMIT University, where he is pursuing a PhD in first-person walkers. His research investigates how to design experiences of curiosity through level design. Alex's work explores how the unknown creates intrigue, transforming exploration. His work has been shared internationally, most recently at the Digital Games Research Association. Our other guest panellist for the evening is Professor Angela Nadalianis. So Angela is a professor in media in the Department of Media and Communication at Swinburne University of Technology. Her research focuses on entertainment media and the convergence of films, video games, television, comic books and theme parks. Her publications include Neo-Baroque Aesthetics and Contemporary Entertainment, Science Fiction Experiences, The Horror Sensorium, Media and the Senses, and the edited book, The Contemporary Comic Book Superhero. So I think the best way to start off this evening is to get a little bit of a taster of what Prey is all about. So can we please roll the tape? What the hell have you done? Tough day, right? Tough day, tough day, right? If I'm talking to myself, it must be. We've been testing a new kind of neuromod based on the Typhon organisms. You've seen what those creatures can do. Once testing starts, there's no going back. Take your time, relax, think it over. No, I'm kidding. You only have nine seconds. Warning. This is a station-wide emergency. If just one of those creatures gets back to Earth, we're lost. The tests, they changed you. I'm sorry. I wish there was another way. Nothing can survive. Whenever you're ready, Morgan. So 
you know, I, I usually can't wait till it's Friday most weeks, but this week a little bit more than others. Um, we like to do things here a little bit different here at Acme. So while we are delving into the development of Prey and also into Raphael's career, we will be live playing through the first hour or so here up on the cinema screen for you to enjoy and to have a little bit of a sneak peek into Prey. So I'd like to hand over, please, to our first panellist, to Alex, and for a conversation with Raph. Oh, thanks. Uh, so, Raph, um, fans of Arcane will probably um, know that there are like common elements in your game, such as supernatural powers and um, the ability to choose how you play the game. Um, and that seems to be there in Prey as well. But I'm wondering, um, in Prey, aside from like the science fiction setting and everything, uh, how is it different to your previous games and uh, what can fans of Arcane expect as well as new players? Well, so first of all, uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, I would say the big difference between uh, all our, all our games and this one, uh, there are, I would say there are two. Uh, one is the power fantasy is different this time. You mm. know, uh, if, you t if you look at Dishonored, it was all about being a supernatural assassin in a steampunk city. Uh, this time it's about, it's a more primal uh, fear and drive. It's about surviving. Uh, in a hostile environment against uh, aliens, you know, so it's very it's very powerful because it's it's immediate. You, you, everybody feels it, so it's it's easy, it's easy to connect with it. Mm. Uh, and uh, the second thing is the structure, the uh, Dishonored, and some of our games before, uh, like Darkness Sab and Magic, was more like mission based, and every every mission was uh, their own little sandbox. Uh, this time it's actually one big contiguous space. It's kind of an open world on, in, in, on the space station, really. So uh, everything's persistent. You can always come back to where you've been and uh, unlock more areas, uh, explore in more non-linear ways. Uh, so it's, uh, in a way, for us, for the ones who remember Arx Fatalis, it's going back to that format. Hmm. Oh, so it's more RPG, in other words, than, than uh, Dishonored is. Right, yeah. So I was going to ask, um, like outside of Arcane's uh, games and everything, what were some influences um, that you might have taken on board for Prey? Um, for instance, like the space station seems to be quite like System Shock, like a massive um, uh, interconnected complex. And the Art Deco art style seems to have a little bit of Bioshock in there as well, keeping that shock tradition going. And uh, the narrative seems to have a little bit of Total Recall there as well, and a bit of body horror and everything, uh, with like the needles in the eye and all that. So, yeah, what were the things that you were kind of inspired by and influenced by that you drew upon um, outside of your own work? Yeah, as far as the uh, type of experience that we wanted to provide, I think the survival on board of a space station and uh, in a hostile environment, and uh, you know, improvising with whatever you have, and in this simulated environment where the AIs can, until they've detected you, they just exist in this environment, right? So that's probably the biggest inspiration for us was uh, System Shock in this in this case. Uh, uh, we we you know we we have a legacy from Looking Glass in uh, some of our team members and our passion. You know the first game that really touched me was uh, I mean I loved Ultima when I was a kid, uh, big big time. But but Ultima Underworld was uh, was probably the the the, the game that really uh, touched me forever. And uh, and since mm. then actually the games that we still do are somehow still inspired by that kind of. Uh, a uh, blend of uh, RPG in first person with a lot of physicality, a lot of player choices and consequences, and uh, you know where simulation is very important. Hmm. So, so that was a big influence for sure. And then, uh, other than that, as far as properties go, like other IPs, uh, it, there's a lot of, of influences, and some of, some were unconscious, some were conscious. Uh, but I can feel, I can see some uh, Lovecraft, uh, 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 you know, writing in there. I can see. Uh, uh, the show Lost. Uh, there's uh, definitely some Total Recall, uh, Matrix, um, and then visually there might be uh, some uh, um, Sunshine. Uh, there's also, uh, as far as story goes, there's also probably some Moon in there. Right. If you know that movie. Um, so yeah, and then of course the the classic um, Aliens and star Starship Troopers. And, uh, How much of that was? Um kind of uh, pre-planned during a pre-production and everything or like naturally came in over development? Uh, what was pre-planned? Uh, like uh, these uh, influences. Were you in pulling things in or like just naturally finding yourself um, inspired by these things as you were developing the game or was it more kind of 
pre-planned when you... Some of it was uh, research, like for example, when we looked at the how to render space and uh, how the, the, the more direct sun and the, how, the, how the light uh, mm. works in space, uh, you know, we, we, used, we, we looked, li literally looked at uh, references just for the sake of it, like, uh, you know, the case of sunshine. Um, but things like Total Recall, I think, was more like, you know, we're writing this story and at some point we realized that it would be uh, a, a nice effect that, that you see a video of yourself and now you're confused, is, is this guy me, is it not me? And so then we realized, oh, that's kind of like, you know, the Total Recall moment. Uh, and so that, I don't think that was very conscious or deliberate. It was more like as, as we were going. Great. Um, so... In Dishonored, you really shook up how the traditional stealth game is played by giving player um, players like all that control, like with Blink and the different abilities and everything. And in Prey, you seem to be shaking up how first-person shooters are played with the glue gun and uh, the mimic abilities, being able to transform into objects, mm -hmm. um, using yeah, your enemy's abilities and all that. So I was wondering, how is it that you give these players this freedom and this control but also balance your levels and your gameplay with challenge. Mm. I think for us, uh, we like we like indirect tools a lot. Um, you know, if you give a gun to a to a player, they, they, that's the most direct uh, way to uh, to to tackle the challenge. So mm. they will use that, and they will not use necessarily the more indirect, more. Uh, uh, creative type of approaches. So, uh, so that's why we uh, we stay pretty low on, on ammo, and uh, instead we, we also give all those other tools that have uh, a direct effect. Like uh, you know, you, the glue gun has a very direct effect, which is to uh, neutralize enemies. Um, but it also has a side effect, and uh, the side effect is that if you if you shoot at a wall, because maybe accidentally, if you miss your uh, your alien and it will shoot on the wall, it creates a uh, a physical ball on which you can actually uh, climb, and uh, and so we try to always design our our powers, our tools this way, and it was the case for Dishonored as well, where there's there's, there's an obvious uh, purpose, and there's also like side effects that uh, that people can make connection, and then create their own uh, way to play with. Right, and um, how much of like that? I guess it's emerging gameplay in a way. These things that you couldn't predict uh, hap happening. How much of that? Do you uh, find like during testing and everything during development or is it more of um, do you find that happening or do you find it's more of a rev revelation after you put the game out and uh, people are playing the game in ways you didn't expect? There's both and that's the beauty of it. Uh, as we are developing it, sometimes we, we find combinations that we, we did not expect and then we we decide what we want to do with them. You know, if it's an exploit, then maybe we nerf it. If it's uh, if it's broken a little bit, then we fix it. If it, um, and if it's almost there, then we we support it. Um, and then we, of course, we see people doing crazy things in, on, on online. You know, mm. as, as already we've seen on the demo, which is which is uh, usually fun and scary at the same time for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in terms of like the um, amount of detail in your environments, like um, arcane games in Prey in particular, like they're very dense, full of like hidden details and secrets and like uh, pathways that you might not notice on the first time, but you'll return and uh, find like a room or like a letter or emails on a computer that will reveal things um, that you otherwise just might have walked right past. Um, and in a sense, I imagine a lot of players might just miss these um, and other players might find them. So do you trust that players will like naturally want to discover these details and kind of seek them out? Or are there like subtle ways that you guide players or kind of encourage them? Mm. There's a bit of both. I think uh, we, um, first of all, uh, as content creators, we, we accept that um, people might see only 50% of our content. And, and that's okay, you know, because they might want to replay again or... Or even if they don't see it, it's 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 kind of part of the bigger picture, and somehow it supports other things that they see, so it's all cohesive. That that's for us. It's very important to create a world that is actually bigger than the game, mm. uh, and uh, and we we really try to justify every character. In the in the case of Talos One, uh, we know exactly how many employees there are, all their names. They are in a list. You find their bodies. They they what they were doing, uh, their email, the communication that they had with other people, and so. And so that 
contributes to to create this huge painting that that little by little become really feeds itself and 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 becomes uh, a very cohesive world where players get lost in and 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 uh, hopefully feel like a a feeling of uh, of traveling and and they like it. it's, it's, there's a sense of place where where that you know something that they've they've really experienced like a, a place that they've really been to like uh, like me it, that leaves memories like when you went somewhere mm. on vacation and then you know years later you remember that you've been there so that and, and the only the way it's, the reason why it works this way is because it's actually really believable everything is tied together we, there's no nothing left to uh, to uh, uh, nothing is actually uh, uh, you know, no, no detail is is accidental. It's all it's we you know we all know why we're doing what we do. Right. So that um, uh, that kind of uh, deliberate um, building of the environment and, ev and everything, um, is that like, uh, is that what kind of makes an arcane game stand out um, compared to other games? Because there's a quite a lot of um, open-ended games seem to be more of a. Uh, more of a thing in the gaming landscape. You see like Breath of the Wild and it has these different interacting systems and ways to play. Um, so is that kind of like coherency with the environment like something that makes arcade games special? Uh, I, I th I'm sure there are some other developers that also have that, uh, that drive, you know, in how they do things, but definitely it's one of our values, yeah, create creating worlds mm -hmm. uh, that uh, our host for uh, a lot of things that might happen. We, we, you know, we create those big space of many possibilities, uh, and uh, and and hope that the player find their own fun in there. Great, yeah. So I imagine there's a few aspiring game developers in the audience. So like behind the uh, the curtain in Arcane, like what is it that you look for um, when picking people who might be interested in a career in, in games development, particularly in a studio like Arcane? Um, well, passion is an obvious one. You know, if you don't have passion, then we, we probably sniff that and, and, and uh, well. Um, but I think uh, it depends also what kind of de what kind of department you're talking about. Uh, the, the ones that are harder to, to hire are usually uh, game designers um, and producers. Programmers, you, you you know you have a school behind you. You might have a piece of codes and to show and what you've done, etc. Art is the same. You can you can show the, the stuff you do. I mean, we cannot know how fast you were doing them, so that's the only question that we might have. But we can judge if if it's if it's gonna be ex uh, good for us. We has producer, which is problem solving. This uh, that's really the main characteristic of a of a producer. You know, it's to be a, pro a problem solver. Uh, it's it's unlikely that we'll we'll be able to detect how, how good of a problem solver you are, uh, and it's the same with game designer. It's you know a lot of, a lot of people have ideas now. Um, how do they fit in the context of our game is is a different thing. So of course we can we can gauge their philosophy of thinking and 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 you know what games they like and why they like them and why it's important and we can test them etc. But those are two that are hard. So I would I would recommend if you if you're a game designer. Um, if you want to be a game designer, to uh, to start with uh, with mods, of course, modding is is the uh, the best way to to show what you can do uh, using tools. We we like uh, game designers that are hands on, that are very technical, uh, and in fact, we like designers that are a mix of designer and producers because they can therefore produce their own features. Um, you know, as if they if if they can also spec out the the. Um, a, a feature the, like a like a gadget or whatever it is like if they could if they can if they can list if they are able to list all the tasks that are associated to that uh, then for us it's uh, it's a it's a good designer great and um, just to, I'd love to ask more questions but just um, to end on like what was your favorite part of creating prey and um, what was the biggest challenge as well you know, um, when creating it uh, well there were several things that were fun and to do and also several things that were very hard to do but um, I think the I think creating the, the as far as challenge go coming uh, coming up with a flavor of aliens that uh, was not too seen before and that was you know that was mysterious and that would provide the kind of mood that we were looking for that that was actually a pretty big uh, undertaking uh, and also, you, you know, when you create a big environment like that, that has 
all the history, of, uh, you know, all the all the reasons why all these departments exist. Like this, this is so. Talos has the research facility, the crew quarters, the the a place that we call the arboretum, where where people uh, relax in some sort of a park. There's also the engineering area, etc. So it has to be somehow cohesive. And so we had to read a lot of papers. A lot of uh, because it's not real, obviously, uh, because reality is not so fun most of the time. So, but we still have to have it grounded enough that it feels real and it feels possible. Otherwise, people just disconnect. So that's a hard, hard balancing act of uh, of designing the full, and it's it's all contiguous. It's not like uh, we can just load next level, next level, and make some sort of abstraction between the. So we had to really look at the full station as as far as a, as a big three D place and, and where everything is and how they connect together. So that was that was a that was a big hard job. But it was also what very what was very fun. Uh, as far as my yeah, my favorite part I think is uh, is coming up with that world and, and uh, it, it's seeing it slowly become alive. Also when you when you first have your first mechanics, your first uh, prototypes of, of uh, uh, powers or gadgets or weapons and, and you start to put them in the in the in, in the simulation and, and see what happens and, and find out new new you know the in a way the game works for yourself for you uh, on its own because they, they are the, you, you put these things together you just define a few rules um, out of context and then when you put these things together they're going to interact and, and something fun might happen and so that's uh, that's also very exciting when the things come alive that's great thank you very much yeah, thank you <gasps> all right. <laughs> I'm really interested in this idea of world building that you're talking about, and because that's something that really struck me. Just seeing, I've got to put them up. Um, just seeing um, the examples online, the trailer, and a few minutes of, of gameplay, even sort of watching it here. Um, and one thing that's really struck me is that the game you've really mixed it up and talked about hy the hybrid structure in interviews as well. And you've got bits of you know action games, shooters, RPG, and even more broadly science fiction, um, horror elements, um, psychological thriller. How in, in, firstly, what influenced influenced you to c create this kind of hybrid, generic world? And secondly, do you think? That's o that's only become the potential of that's only become more possible, given the the place that game technology is today. Mm. Oh wow! So that's a it's a multi of multi folded question. Um, so the, the, <laughs> it's the, a hybrid question. It's a hybrid question. <laughs> uh, the first one, as far as like hybrid hybrid uh, ness of, of our products, and, and um, so, so let me know if, if if I'm not answering your question, but I, I think. Uh, in our case, not having something uh, which is just FPS or which is just RPG uh, in the same with, you know, it's not just about survival, it's also about identity, it's also about uh, empathy, uh, so all these themes. I think it's to ha it it's contributes to have an experience that is multidimensional as opposed to having something very narrow where, you know, the goal is just to shoot, for example, which is perfectly fine mm -hmm. in some games. Um, but that's not the experience we're trying to, to provide. We're trying to provide something that is uh, uh, probably slower in pace, deeper, uh, that will lead to more permutations of possibilities, etc. So, so it's just uh, for us, it's just adding dimensions to the to the to the experience. I think which gives the player greater flexibility, doesn't it? Right. And, and different types of experiences, which is what I really love about um, this idea. Yes, that's mm. what we want. We want uh, different type of players to just find their, their own fun in, in this kind of mm. space. Mm. Um, and as far as uh, the technology, I think the technology is... Uh, I'm biased about... I'm, I'm, I'm torn about this because um, I think that this, this, this is the first generation of hardware where we could have done the same game the hardware before. You know, if you, if you think of the history of... Uh, if you think of the, the history of video games, uh, there was first 2D, and then it, it, it was accelerated 2D, and then, and then you know, some sort of 3D, and then now we could finally put a lot of characters in 3D, etc. So there was always a reason to go mm. further, a more memory. That, and, and for this time, it feels like, well, I could do exactly the same game last generation. It's just that now it's prettier. Uh, and, it's, uh, and by prettier, it means just harder to make, really. Mm. Uh, because now I'm going to spend more time, more effort, on uh, on every assets and every animation and, and and so in a way I would say you know a few years ago you could the player would abstract a lot of what you 
what you communicate through the game. Uh, if there was an object under the under the table, uh, you you just uh, click on it and it would pop up in your inventory or something. Now imagine in ten years you will have to kneel, have the hand reach the object, and, and, and then maybe it clips through it. So so then you just say, well, let's cut the feature. Let, let's not let's not take objects under under the table then because it's too heavy. So in a way, technology could actually reduce your game. Uh, so it's it's again and, and but at the same time. And there are ways in which technology allows you to do things you could not before. Mm. Uh, physics is a, is a great example, you know. Uh, so it's a it's a it's an ambiguous answer that I'm giving you, unfortunately. No, but, it's uh, really because the one thing that really struck me, I've I've been playing around a lot with a lot of the virtual reality stuff that's out there, and it just it it just reeks virtual reality. Make me into a VR game. And everyone's been talking about, well, what are the possibilities of future narratives and, you know, in, in the VR space that isn't just reproducing, say, watching a film or... Um, and it, it just strikes me as this would be the kind of thing you'd love immersing yourself in and, and sort of getting engaged in the world. And I think one of the, the really amazing things is the design of this game. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the whole process? Who was involved and... Um, the artists involved and the graphic designers. And so you're talking about the visual design? The visual design, yeah. yeah. Um, so we knew at first we, we wanted a special type of uh, sci-fi. We were, you know, we, we, the same way for Dishonored, we wanted our version of steampunk, and so mm. we wanted our own version of sci-fi this time. And uh, But what does it mean exactly is, uh, is unclear. Uh, we, we knew we did not want to just go for with, with white panels, you know, the, the kind of sci-fi that everybody yeah. has in mind. Um, and uh, a lot of things have been done already, but we, we are uh, attracted to Terry Gilliam as a, as, a, as, a, as a visual designer. He has this very uh, raw, exposed technology, and there's something mm. that we, we really like about that. But, but his style is very dark, so, and, and our monsters are dark. So, so then we went the other way, you know, still kind of like raw technology, but like a more uh, the, the colorful uh, 70s one. And so, so then it took a while, but... We worked uh, partially with uh, with the art director in France, uh, who uh, who came to uh, his name is Sebastien Miton. He was the is the, the art director of Dishonored 2, and uh, he came to Austin, and uh, we spent about a week uh, and not making any drawing. It was one week really? of just talking, yeah, because that's how it starts. Uh, if you want to create a world. Uh, the way it works for us anyway is to define the narrative behind why the world is the way it is. Mm. And so in our case, we, we decided to go back in the 60s, uh, even though the game happens in, in 2032. We still went back to, to the 60s to, to really bring some background to this world. And we, we changed one thing that would make our world uh, our own world as opposed to the world as it exists, we, we said, well, what if JFK actually had survived his assassination? And, and from there, then you can derive, it's the, it's the butterfly thing, you know, yeah. where, what yeah. would happen if, and, and then you can derive all the, the rules of your new world. You know, the uh, space program would have been stronger because he was very personally invested in, mm. in space. Uh, he had an interest for space. Uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So you, you do all your what if things. And, and so that defines some sort of guidelines where everything you do is then filtered through those, those, uh, those rules mm -hmm. and you come up with, a new, with an environment that is coherent, that feels real even though it's, uh, feels even though it's not, right? But it's, but it's so coherent that it could be real. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of, that's key to, the, to immersion and to uh, make people uh, travel in, into your world and, and, and buy into it. I mean, it's just stunning just looking at the images sort of here and I can imagine how painstakingly um, difficult it was and how, many, how much time it would have taken as well. Um, the other uh, thing about the game that um, I find interesting is that you can choose to play Morgan Yu as a male or a female. Mm. What made you, I guess, what, what made you decide to allow that option and is it different playing either character? Do you have different experiences or is it up to the player to control that? So, so in the case of Prey, uh, having two characters is not really having two characters. It's having one character of two different genders. So it's not like uh, in, in For Dishonored where we had Corvo and Emily. Uh, 
Uh, this time it's really the same character mm. and they have very little uh, imposed personality. They have a background, but they don't have much imposed personality. So uh, the, we want you to feel like you are that character. And so choosing your gender is just part of that identification mm. uh, because we have about, I'm not sure in Australia what the numbers are, but in America we have about 50% of the gamers that are female. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so and it's it, great to see that you know, game producers and companies are actually starting to recognise that now. Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah for sure. Uh, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we're very sensitive to that. Um, so yeah, that's 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 just the reason. And I guess, sort of related to that, is um, in terms of gameplay, the, there are apparently multiple possibilities in terms of the endings, depending on the choices you make along the way, and 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 that's um, uh, controlled and I guess directed a lot by the AI. Um, Technology is this right? Uh, you yeah. So you you can there's a there's a few permutation in endings which which is going to be based on what you've done and the AIs that you've met and saved and and uh, there's some other survivors on the on the space station uh, and uh, every time you meet a survivor you you can or cannot do things for them you can just kill them if you want to. Uh, we like that we like that ambiguity about yeah. uh, you know giving all those possibilities and then of course we have to support all those possibilities, which is a lot of work. Uh, we spend, at Arcane, we spend a lot of time just uh, uh, fixing all the crazy things that players could do, uh, and that's something we like to do. How many of you were in the team working on, the, on this game? Uh, so it's hard to know specifically in numbers because it varies a lot uh, over Depending over time. The you know, there's mm. there are moments where we, we 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 contract a lot of people. Then there are moments where we we go uh, a smaller, t thinner team so that we can just like focus on polishing, etc. Uh, but we started this game uh, shortly after Dishonored, so that's about four years ago. Uh, and at first it was just like you know one or two person, and, and then really more and more. Uh, we also have contractors, you know, people from all over the world working for us. Oh. My final question, and in a sense, I mean, it really interests me because it's so cool. Who came up with the idea of um, Mimic Meta? <laughs> <laughs> it's an idea. Well, you know, when I was talking about the, the, the game defining itself like a painting, uh, so it's an idea that just came to us uh, for free because uh, what happened was that we, uh, we were designing the... Um, uh, the the aliens. We were designing also the um, the neuromods, like and and mm. how you acquire those powers, etc. And so at some point, so we had the mimic uh, power on the aliens much before we had the the, the player version of that. So we, we we designed a monster that was inspired by the mimic from uh, Dungeon and Dragons, uh, the, this creature that turns into a chest. Well, actually, that is a chest. Mm. Turns a chest, and as you approach, it bites you. Uh, so the idea was that, well, what if we do that but for, uh, with everything? And this creature would actually turn into objects around and it would be all dynamic and you never know which one it is. And so that's not really cool. So we did that and, and it was fun. And, and then there was in parallel to that, there was another system where we would acquire powers from the, uh, from the monsters. And, uh, and this one, for some reason, we never thought of it as a power. We thought it was just like part of its, uh, of its behavior more than a power. And at some point we needed more powers. And, and we thought, hold on, if we if we acquire powers from the from the the monsters, and so we had a list at this point, and we thought like maybe we should just acquire the the, the mimicry, and uh, so that's that's what we uh, and, and everybody was kind of uh, you know big guys in the in the room. <laughs> like, well, do we really do that? It's gonna be it's gonna be funny. It's gonna be weird. It's gonna be hard, etc. And so we tried, and it was indeed funny and weird and all that. But it's it's cool at the same time. So. And really effective. It's really so yeah. creepy, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. A really, really insightful discussion. Um, so for everyone here in the audience, we actually have an extra special surprise guest here tonight. Um, can you please put your hands together for music uh, producer, composer and soundtrack designer for Prey and many other games, Mick Gordon. Uh, Mick. Fantastic to have you here in attendance tonight. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much for having me. So I think we've each got um, a, a question for you and also we will open up um, later on for some questions for the audience. Um, I'd like to begin by saying I think the soundtrack is incredibly evocative in Prey. Um, it's futuristic yet retro feeling at the same time. So what were some of your influences going into Prey and in the soundtrack design for the game? Yeah, that's a really cool question. So um, most honestly, most of the inspiration and things came from Rav. 
Um, RAF is really, really interesting to work with because RAF speaks in concepts. So normally when I'm working on a project, people will say, like, um, we have a problem and we, we need music to fix that problem. So there is an environment where you might be fighting with uh, some sort of enemy or whatever, and we need it to feel a bit more action-y, a bit more, a bit more, uh, a bit more tense. And so music is often the thing that kind of solves that problem. Um, so we don't often speak in concepts. Usually, it's solving solving an issue. But with Raf, speaking with Raf, Raf would sit down and say, "Look, I want you to write some music that evokes the feeling of floating in zero gravity, and use an electric guitar and synthesizers, for example." And um, when you're given that sort of creative framework to work with, that inspiration kind of naturally comes. Those are your tools, you've got the goal there that you've got to achieve, and then you can just kind of start experimenting. So a lot of those inspirations and things came from, from Raf's direction, which is really, really quite unique. You definitely don't find that on many projects, for sure. Yeah. Nick? Uh, Alex? So in the Prey demo, there's the bit where you hop into the helicopter and there's this great synthwave track that plays. And I'm quite a fan of synthwave. So I'd like to know, what's the story behind that particular track? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So I went to visit Arcane in Austin, uh, which was so much fun. Austin is an incredible city. If anybody ever gets a chance to go visit Austin, it's absolutely wonderful. It's a really, really wonderful place. And um, we did this sort of demo playthrough. Often when doing a studio visit, one of the biggest things you'll do is actually sit down and play the game and talk through the game and things like that. It's really, really cool. It's a very integral part of the experience because it allows you to absorb the game at that point in time. This is before it's come out. This is past the concept stage. It's when the developers are really, really excited about it. And, uh, and you know, it, it's a really, just a really good time to kind of get in there. And they showed me this incredible experience that you kind of witnessed before where you wake up in your apartment, you're in the middle of San Francisco, you jump in this helicopter, and you're flying across the city with this huge credit sequence, which looked utterly ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. It was just, just so excessive, right? Completely excessive. You've got this private helicopter, you're flying through the giant words in the city. It was completely excessive. So this kind of idea of like excessive commercialism kind of came into the idea. Um, and of course, for that, we've got to look at the 80s, right? To me, the 80s was kind of popped up for that. And so for me, that was actually a really big tribute to the opening credit sequence of The Breakfast Club where you have this really out of place song which has nothing to do with the film whatsoever that lasts about three minutes. And um, the kind of idea started to flow from there. And we just kind of, you know, started grooving into some, uh, some nice chords and stuff like that and groovy beats and things and just out of confidence and helicopter and it's all excessiveness and grooviness and that sort of thing. So that's kind of where that, that came from. Um, but it's interesting because it's really resonated with players quite a lot, which is great. Um, yeah, the, it the, really stands out and kind of contrasts against everything else that you hear in the soundtrack. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's cool. The best way I've heard it described so far was uh, the Let's Play guy, uh, Greg Miller, playing through it. And he hears it and he says, oh, this makes me want to make Sweet 80s love to Kim Basinger. <laughs> 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 On that note, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> See, synthesizers make me think of John Carpenter. Yeah. It's mm. like the ultimate in terms of the building suspense mm. and, and creating that kind of um, sort of atmosphere and tone and sense of, um, you know, something's waiting around the corner. Um, and what, one thing that really strikes me about the sound and music um, in, in what I've seen so far is how in incredibly evocative it is, but also how it impacts on you know, the, the player or even the viewer, because it's both music and also these crashing sounds and that really kind of immerse you even further into the game action. Could you yeah. tell us a little bit about, about that process? Yeah, of course. So Matt Pearsall, who's the audio director on um, Prey, worked really, really super hard and really close with Raf and the team um, to get this unique blend. And that's something that we really talked about strongly as well. And so we're a big fan of what I'm with any project that we try to work on is this, this concept that we call blend. And what I mean by that is that you can't really quite tell what is sound design and what is music. Mm. Um, it means that the music often obviously plays an emotional role, but it is, is obviously playing a sound design role as well, especially in science fiction where the sounds of synthesizers and things give us this evocative feeling of, of science fiction and things. But then often the sound design itself, and Matt and his team work really, really hard on that to get the sound design to have some sort of a musical quality. Now, when I say that, I don't mean when you're firing the gun, it sounds like it's playing a melody or something. What I mean is that it gives you an emotional response which is traditionally the role of music, but sound design can definitely take that role as well. So when these two things start to blend together, we get a really cohesive experience. And were there any particular influences aside from the synthesizer and Breakfast Club um, in terms of your music influences? 
Yeah, again, a lot of that sort of thing came from, from Rav. Rav gave me this really great direction in the beginning, um, which is where he said he wanted to the music to sound like a spaghetti western in space. Ooh, nice. And, I mean, any brief like that is going to come up with all sorts of things. I mean, even if you're a visual artist and somebody says to you, I want you to make a western in space, it's like there's so many like great things that you can kind of pull upon there. So uh, once you get that framework, you'll find that the ideas kind of tend to generate themselves. The worst thing is the blank canvas. The worst thing is somebody having me, here's a blank canvas, what do you think? You know, there's nothing to work with there. You need some substance that you can draw upon. So the idea of the spaghetti western, which is a great term as well, it's not just western, it's spaghetti western, so we always have a, a deeper term of, uh, of language to use there. Uh, in space, it's just really, uh, you know, that's the thing. That's where the ideas come from. Could I ask one more question? Of sorry, course sorry you can. to hog. No, no, please do. I'm really fascinated by how the music adapts to the gameplay. How do you do that? <laughs> so yeah, that's a that's a very very complex uh, thing. It's really really interesting where we've gone with video games because we started with video game sound with original sort of chip sounds, right? Where there would be code sitting in the background that would generate a sine wave and tell the sine wave to do something. Mm -hmm. By sine wave, I just mean a basic like musical tone. So one of the best examples of this is, uh, is Super Mario Brothers jump sound. It's a very, very basic sine wave, which is told to go up. So every time you, we, uh, little Mario guy jumps, we have that rising tone, which is so iconic, right? And from there, we started to record instruments and you might, record the say a single piano note and then include that on a chip right with the super nintendo or something and then you'd have a, a script running in the background that would play a melody with that single piano note and that's where things kind of evolved from there now what that technology allowed was you to be able to speed up music change music when enemies came and make music more calm when you wanted to yeah. explore sort of things and so that sort of stuff was being done back then which is quite interesting. From there, we evolved into uh, CD audio, so where you would then record a band or record an orchestra and put it on the CD, and then that piece of music would actually trigger. Uh, it would just play back when, the, when the, that moment would happen in game. But we lost this sense of deep immersion. It was literally just like having a CD playing along at the same time. Now, what we're able to do with this technology that we're working with now is kind of go back and make full circle to that, that, that original concept of having the music that is able to speed up and slow down and change and all that sort of thing and evolve. Um, it's really, really super complicated. We use a lot of really interesting tools that we can do with it. Uh, essentially, a lot of it comes from sitting down, playing through the game and understanding what possibilities there are. What can happen at any one point? So the player standing in this environment here, at any one point, any one of these objects could turn out to be a mimic and attack the player. The player might actually be in a simulation now. We don't know. That sort of thing might happen. So once we define all of these several possibilities, we write music for every single possibility. That's then crazy. we create a system that allows that one piece of music to transition into this piece of music, or that to transition into that piece of music, etc. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, quite a long process. We also identify the context, right? So you know that if you are in combat, then now you, we, it, you go with this kind of bank, and, and if, if some other event happened, like maybe you are low on health, then the, then the things start to layer together. And the programming triggers it. Yeah, so yeah. it's all about, uh, you know, we have a, a response rule, like a set of, of contexts that we identify in the game, and then things blend together. I was hoping you'd say that there are music elves, and they watch <laughs> you play, so it's like, she's coming around the corner, there's, a, there's an alien here, come on, rip it up, rip it up. <laughs> That's honestly the goal, the goal is to make it feel very organic. The worst thing is when it feels like the game has triggered something, you don't want it to feel like that, it needs to feel organic, like it happened naturally. Great, thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, look, as many of you might know, uh, we are actually live streaming tonight's event. So I'd like to give a big shout out to EB Games and to their community. And we actually have a few questions from the audience here at home uh, for you, Raf. So to start with, um, Prey has been described as an open world game. So what's involved with creating a feeling of exploration in an environment like outer space or perhaps the Talus Station? Uh, I think I partially answered this question earlier um, when it was about how, how we designed the, this environment. But... Um, it's it's specifically it's, it's different for than the designing a um, like somewhere in, on Earth where you know there's there's more reference first of all. Uh, in this case, we had to invent entirely the the how the structure of this of this station works. Um, so that was that was a big work with uh, using some references, some uh, some papers about uh, some scientific stuff, etc. Um, and also just some imagination. Um, but you know we 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 would think of all the how 
so this is a company and what what is their purpose what do they do there uh, where do the employees uh, are, are first uh, coming from where, where do the visitors come from come where, where, where do they uh, eat and sleep and uh, etc so there's all this logic that is behind it uh, that leads to make this huge space and then once you have the idea of it like you know that over there there's the crew quarters over there there's the, the engineering etc you you give that to your to your architects uh, your architects and your and your artists and your architects actually are part of the uh, concept uh, art team mm -hmm. so together this they start in 3d making making some shapes some some uh, some connection uh, between rooms and, and and defining some style based on some references that we find on pictures or some some 2d concept artists uh, and, and then it's iterative. Then we, you know, then it rolls back to a lot of reviews between all of us, and uh, and the level designers are also in the loop because they, you know, at the same time they design their missions and and their their, their, their quests and what what they how the AIs are going to be placed, etc. So it's a lot of everything coming together. Uh, next one is the uh, Typhon we've seen so far have a pretty varied appearance. Um, how does this play into the combat of Prey and have we got any surprises awaiting us in the future? <laughs> uh, yes, it was actually very fun to work on those because uh, it's not human uh, and it's not the classic monster with uh, you know claws and teeth. And uh, so, so we wanted to do something that is a little surprising and unexpected. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the mimics, they have um, they have a really interesting rigging, uh, in, and they're, they, they're both rigid and very flexible at the same time. So sometimes they they walk like spiders, and sometimes they walk like snakes, based on based on their mood, if they're in attack or if they are like uh, just exploring. So those those are little telegraphing that are very subtle, but they probably work on on the player's uh, mind. But we do have a very surprising one that we haven't shown yet at all. As it's a monster that I think is more scary than the mimic. Mm. Gonna have to wait until Friday to get a yes. chance for that one. Yes. Um, so some of the focus on Prey so far has been around the horror or the thriller elements. So how would you rate the fear factor of the game, and um, what are some of the techniques that you've used in order to really ramp up the scares into something we haven't seen before in in this kind of horror game? So this is the most surprising part of, of this entire experience for us of having released the demo is that we uh, we were not expecting people to be so freaked out by, by the by the monsters. Uh, we and in, in fact we were not set to make a horror game. We, we for us it's a psychological thriller. Mm -hmm. There's uh, there's more of a mystery of um, why you are here. You know, like when you find out that you're not where you thought you are. Uh, and, and who did that to you? And, and so there are all these themes that, that, that drive the player. But, but, the, the, but we never had an intention to make a, um, a, a horror game. And because a horror game would be uh, uh, very targeted, like our goal is to, f to, to scare you off, which was, it's not the goal. Um, so as far as uh, how scary is the game, I, 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 obviously it seems to be a little scary, but uh, I, I don't think that's uh, necessarily the, the, the goal all along. It, I think at some point you get a little more comfortable with the, with, with the environment and, and, and your drive changes. And the final one from the uh, EB Games community. Um, a few of the shots we've seen so far uh, include Morgan using weapons like the glue cannon in a more practical way, um, like putting out fires or, as we've seen earlier, jumping up walls. Um, how does this work within Prey to incorporate a puzzle-solving element into the game? And, um, yeah, and how much does this affect your outcome towards the end? So we don't really have... Uh, our approach to puzzles is not very... It's not like a, a, a true puzzle. It's not like... Uh, Hey, you know, you're you're locked in a room, and uh, I, I love Portal. It's one of my favorite games. But this is not like Portal, for example, right? Uh, it's more we design environments, and there are many ways to do things, uh, and and so the player find their own puzzle in a way. They 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 are out of ammo of this, or they or or, or they are f they find themselves in a weird situation where there are way too many monsters down there, and so they think, well. I'm not going to go down there because there are all those monsters. So, so maybe I'm going to use like I still have a little bit of glue. So I'm going to put some you know glue balls over there and then jump on them so that I can bridge the gap. You know, and so that's that's kind of an improvised puzzle, like yep. an improvised solution, right? Uh, so that's more the way we look at it. Yeah, so really offering it up to player agency in the way they would like to choose their path throughout the game. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Um, so we would like to open it up to the audience for questions now. Um, again, as we're live streaming, um, can you please just introduce yourself with your name to begin with? And just a quick note on questions. Um, look, I'm sure many of you might be eager to ask some questions about uh, the first Prey game or, of course, the, the cancelled sequel. Um, look, uh, Raf and the team have been asked this many, many times. They haven't worked specifically on their games, so they're not really going to be able to talk to those, but more to be able to talk about the current iteration of Prey. So if you'd like to ask a question, please throw your hands up and we will get you the mic. Uh, third row. Can I, can I ask a question myself? Of course, like, you, can. Uh, who, of course you can. How many of you have played the demo? All right, well, cool, thank you. Did you like it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Rachel. Uh, just firstly, you're known for being quite diverse in your inclusion in having the choice of both male and female protagonists in your games. Firstly, I'm just curious, will having a male-female lead option be your standard moving forward uh, now? And, oh, sorry, my phone just died. <laughs> and what measures, uh, sorry, <laughs> and what measures does Arcane Studios take to make sure that that inclusiveness, such as women in games, like female game makers, uh, is a part of their game development teams? Uh, okay, so there's two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is it a standard for us or the industry in general to that there are both male and female protagonists? Um, so I think f so far it's been working out this way for us, but I don't think it's, uh, it, has done, it doesn't have to be a rule. It's, uh, it is possible that for a, for a specific game we just want to tell the story of, of that character and it could be a female or a male. So I don't think we will, you know, it could be just female, it could be just male. I don't think we'll always um, committing to, to offer both. Uh, in this case it works because it's a game about you as a, as a, as a player being identified with this character. Um, as far as uh, game developers, uh, female game developers, we, we have a lot actually in, in, at Arcane. We, um, uh, in fact, as a, we, we have the most female uh, developer in, in any of the Bethesda studios, and um, including in, in uh, yeah, I mean, our, our lead producer is, uh, is a woman, our, uh, um, our director uh, assistant, our, um, um, we have two, two programmers, uh, we have our lead architect, so th those are big positions. Fantastic. Uh, next question, please. Just here in the second row. And just a quick note, for those interested in uh, female developers, we have a new exhibition coming up later this year at Acme called Codebreakers, celebrating uh, fantastic female game developers from around the world. Um, hi, Raf. My name is Kyle. Um, online, I'm Head Scrow Back. Um, I, for starters, I'm super excited for this game. I um, formally congratulate you on it. It looks absolutely amazing from what we've seen up here so far and the one hour demo it's fantastic to say the least um what i would like to ask you is what are you most proud of in the game and what are you most afraid of hmm. uh i think i'm i'm proud and afraid of the same thing i think i'm really proud of the the amount of possibilities and and um all the details, all the... Uh, I think by the time you're done with the game, you, you will probably have spent a lot of hours and uh, you probably will have find your own path through it, through all those possibilities, you know. Um, but I'm also, I'm also afraid that, uh, you know, if you, 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 might, you might take a weird path that... And, and if you always... If you never go for the fun and you always like go away from it or something, you, you, you know, experience might might be the. De I think the delta between players will be huge, uh, and so that's that's a fear that I have. Uh, and you know, fortunately, I think so far our our testers are having fun. But uh, it, it's a game. It's it's a little bit like you know Fallout. You could play Fallout and and just like constantly you know, take take a path that is not so exciting for you because uh, it might be exciting for someone else, but, you know, we, we just hope that you will find your fun there. Uh, yeah, so just in the middle there, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Justin. Now, um, I would like to say the, um, well, during the live stream, that the game looks, well, amazing. Thank like, you. Like... I noticed that the, um, all the objects, I'm just wondering, like, 
how do you get the objects to look to look like well this and like look so good and like um, suit environments? Uh, well, first of all, we it's. Um I'm not sure if you talk about the design of them or the execution of them. Uh, as, as far as design goes, we, um, uh, we design absolutely every object. Uh, and, and so that sounds silly, but the chairs, the tables, the, the trash can, everything is, has actually, actually been drawn uh, and designed with references and, and so that it's part of a, of a cohesive universe. Uh, as far as the execution, it's it's um, uh, PBR uh, lighting, so it's uh, you know it comes with a new generation of hardware. So there's a there's a lot of uh, uh, new um, material passes that we have access to these days to 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 get things more and more realistic and more and more uh, impressive visually. Uh, and then this is just a, just a lot of time and a lot of uh, skilled uh, artists from all over the world. Hey, uh, second right, thank you. Hey, Raf. Uh, my name's Trent. Hi. I'm just, I find it really interesting, I actually work in games as well, and I find it really interesting that you and Harvey are co-creative directors. I'd love to hear you speak to, well, maybe how you and Harvey met and came to work together, and then how you actually function as co-creative directors, I think it's it's super interesting and in whether you have particular areas and, and how you break ties and all those sorts of things. Uh, so we were we were actually co-creative director on Dishonored. Uh, we were working every day together. And then for Dishonored 2, he became the creative direct, sole creative director of, of Dishonored 2 and, I, and I'm the, the only creative director of, of Prey. But both of us having the title of creative director at Arcane makes us co-creative director as far as the studio level, right? Uh, however, we did we did co-direct uh, Dishonored One actually, so that was a cool experience. Uh, and uh, the way we met is uh, we didn't know uh, that we had met already through uh, System Shock uh, because he started in um, at Origin in '93, and I studied at EA in France in '93 as well. And both of us were QAing uh, we were in QA for System Shock. Uh, and uh, guess what? It stayed with us, right? It's, uh, I think it's uh, such a powerful game that uh, we, we both uh, wanted to m make games that were in that style. And uh, later on, uh, when I was still at EA, I think in 97 or something, yeah, it's 97, and I wanted to visit Origin because I was a big fan of Origin. They are in Texas, Austin, uh, to meet Richard Garriott, who was the creator of Ultima. And uh, and that's where I actually for the first time met Harvey. Uh, I I was given a tour of the studio and and he showed me his the game he was working on, a game that never shipped. Um, but you know that was the first time we we met. And then after that we he started uh, he worked for Iron Storm, the the makers of Deus Ex. I started Arc uh, I started Arcane in '99. And uh, at this point I was uh, he you know we would both. His game was more famous than mine. The sex was a bigger game than Art Fatalis, but but because it was in the same genre, he knew of us and and uh, and kind of was still following us, and I was following them, and and uh, and so I went back to Texas again because I was excited by their game, and so that and so we became a little more friends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, and then in uh, at some point he left or uh, he left Iron Storm. He worked for a company called Midway. I was still with Arcane because Arcane started in '99 and. We're still around, so it's been 18 years actually, which sounds crazy, uh, but um, it's the it's true. And uh, at some point, he left Midway. Mid, uh, I think Midway uh, they they, were, they went uh, bankrupt, and uh, we were. Yeah, he asked me, "It's like, do do you think we can work together?" Uh, I, well, at first, I was a little uh, worried that there would be too many cook in the kitchen. And uh, because we both kind of do the same thing, really, and uh, and so we tried, and it we, this way we worked on, on on Dishonored, and it was actually great. Uh, yep, down here in the front row. Thanks. Um, G'day, I'm um, Riley. Um, I was wondering, uh, there must be an immense pressure with large-scale development to have like a minimum amount of time, like maybe like of play. So, sorry, um, it might need to be like a 12-hour game or an 8-hour game or mm. something if you're going to charge a certain price tag. Um, 
do you feel like you'd like to move towards smaller, smaller hour, like smaller playtime, and you can get sort of the same kind of hyper detail, more focused kind of thing without having that stress of adding in extra gameplay and variety and things like that? Uh, it is true that there's a, there's an odd uh, time pressure thing where, like, uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I personally don't like games that are super, super long, but um, it feels like people want to spend 300 hours on a game. Uh, that said, I think um, it depends what kind of experience you're providing. Uh, yes, I, I, I would love to, to, to work on a, you know, it could be anything, like a haunted house kind of experience that is going to last only an hour or two, which would be perfect for maybe VR or this kind of format, right? Um, but uh, the games we do need a little, little more breathing space, and, and so we, it would be hard to wrap it up in five hours. Uh, so, so I think uh, in our case, this game is actually very long. It's, it's longer than Dishonored. Uh, and um, and it, it, it works well with the, with the format of the game. It works well with the experience we're trying to do. Uh, yep, third row. So I wanted to ask about like the whole reboot process. So Prey is a reboot of an older game um, that's fairly different to what we're seeing now. So I'd, I'd like to know like what drove the decision to reuse the Prey name and why isn't the game we're seeing in front of us just come as a brand new intellectual property? Uh, so we, we started this game uh, shortly after Dishonored, and uh, the, you know as we as we mentioned before, the some of the inspirations were uh, System Shock, so this kind of game where you are trapped in an environment that is hostile, etc. And uh, it was in space. Uh, we wanted aliens. Uh, and uh, later on, so we, at this point, we still had a stage, uh, a code name, uh, not a stage name, a code name, and um, and so we did not have a, a, a real name yet. And the name became available. Um, it's the you know, the IP of Prey belongs to Bethesda, and they they um, asked us if it would make sense for us. Uh, and it had been ten years. The themes were uh, similar: space, aliens, space station, uh, first-person shooter. And so we, uh, so we took it. We took the name, um, and, and and that's it. Uh, but the rest is is just entirely uh, other than the name. There's there's nothing in common with the original. Yep. Uh. Hi, uh, my name is Nigel. Um, I was just wondering about the choice of um, CryEngine, um, say over uh, one of your in-house engines or something you've used in the past. Uh, I think it was a matter of timing, really. Uh, when we... So Dishonored 2 started a little bit before um, Prey, and, and back then there was absolutely no engine that was available. It was like right during the transition. So uh, Unreal 3 was too old, Unreal 4 was not ready. Uh, CryEngine did not do console back then. So then so then we decided to go with the it Tech engine and um, and build on top of that. We, we did our own renderer, we did everything. Uh, so it's been a very, very uh, heavy um, work. And, and when you do that together as making a game, you know you're, 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 you're signing up for a lot of suffering. <laughs> so, so there was no way we were gonna add another game to that. To that. And, uh, and, and since uh, Press added a little later, it's just we're talking about a few months really, and, and, and then uh, Crytek announced that they were actually already on console. So, so that's why, basically. Yep, uh, right at the back, please. Uh, hi, my name's David. Uh, I just have a question. So during development, uh, was, was there a major feature or concept that you really liked that you had to scrap or revise in a major way due to uh, player feedback during testing? Uh, yes, 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 there are. Uh, there's been a lot of those, um, you know, uh, killing features and adding some new ones, etc. is really, really part of our process all the time. The game is very alive. There's uh, we we don't get too attached to any of those. Um, but uh, some example I have, I think, is uh, uh, we we used to have a trauma system where, in addition to all of the things that you have to 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 to, to deal with in this game, you, you, would, you would have things such as if you jump from too high, you break a leg. 
uh, or your your weapon degrades, or or, uh, or you can get a concussion if you if you get hit on the head, and, and now you have to find some pharma to cure that, etc. And that was just one too many layer of things for the player to uh, to deal with. So we so we we did remove that from the game, for example. Yep. Stanley, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm John. Um, I was wondering, um, looking at the game, and you mentioned before um, that your co-partner um, worked on Deus Ex. Um, how much of like uh, this game was inspired by like Deus Ex and its mechanics? Uh, I think you know the the Deus Ex uh, the Deus Ex philosophy is is definitely something that we uh, we re we really like at Arcane. It's uh, itself come also from the Looking Glass kind of mentality. It's, uh, there's uh, some sort of a school of of thinking there uh, uh, between former Looking Glass people, former Ironstone people, us uh, irrational. Um, and uh, yeah, so there is, yeah, it's, there's definitely some, some DNA in common. Gonna get you 10,000 uh, 10, steps today. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Hi. <laughs> when the mimic takes a form like a chair, how much of that is pre-scripted? How much is that as the, uh, the AI making a decision? So at the beginning of the game, we have a few that are prescripted uh, so that we can uh, get you familiarized with, with, with those. And, uh, but later on, they, in fact, already in the demo, you probably have s m m meet them in, in situations where they will just dynamically turn into anything that is around them. Hi, um, I'm Maddie. I'm Delicracy on YouTube, and I was really thrilled with the demo. I tried it out uh, last week or the week before, and I just have to say to Mick, is it? Um, I, sorry, I just thought the intro music was so awesome, <laughs> and it just gets you so pumped up for the game. <laughs> um, and I was wondering whose idea it was to make all the titles come up on the buildings while you're in the helicopter. Uh, I I had seen this in a movie and I can't remember which one it was um, and, and it's not exactly the same implementation but I, I had seen a, a a movie where they 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 physically uh, put the abstract titles in the world and I, and I thought that was uh, really cool so I asked my my art director to to see how we could do that in our in our case so it's like between him and I basically. Yeah, I really liked it. Um, I thought it was really effective. And also, Raf, I was just wondering, what games do you play, and how often do you play games with your work? So I'm like a, an old jaded cook. That, that, uh, <laughs> 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 so uh, it's really hard to capture my attention with games. But uh, I would say, so I would say that. Um, the the latest game I played was actually well the latest big game I played was Fallout 4 so every every time there's a Fallout or a Skyrim or I'll, I'll always been I'll, I'll always be excited by that uh, Fallout New Vegas I loved um, but uh, recently I've played uh, Insight actually Inside sorry uh, which is uh, some sort of an indie game um, and I really really liked it it's very very different than the type of the game we do but uh, as also I play a lot of indie games surprisingly you know smaller games. Uh, as far as big games go, I'm actually really, really looking forward to Shadow of War. Um, I, I really liked actually the Nemesis system in, in Shadow of Mordor, and I think they're pushing it uh, in the next round, so that's very exciting to me. We've got time for just one or two more questions. Uh, Hindle? Hi, I'm uh, Nick, or Stab Stabbies on Twitch. Um, so with the Mimic... Uh, feature um, in the game later on, of course. Um, how varied is the uh, the things you can turn into? Say, if I wanted to go away from keyboard, I turn into like a banana or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can turn into anything that uh, the the mimic can turn into. So there's a there's a range between um, you know the, the size of a um, a cup to uh, a chair. Probably that those are the two extremes. In, in, and but anything dynamic you can turn into including the things that are in your inventory. You, know, you can just drop it and turn it into this thing. Mm. Very cool. Uh, final question? Just over here on the left thing. 
Hello, uh, my name's Ethan, a bit of a long-winded one. So <laughs> I've been getting really hyped for this game. It looks very awesome. I've been watching all sorts of YouTube videos by Bethesda. I've been reading magazines, all that. And from what I understand, it sounds like there are two classes of Neuromod in the game, uh, human abilities and alien abilities. And, it, and from what I understand, there are consequences for installing too much alien abilities. Um, I was wondering, in addition to the more immediate consequences, uh, are, there, are there story changes for, for doing so? Like, do characters address you differently, or do you get different endings if you install a heap of weird alien stuff? So there might or might not be consequences. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you really want to know? Uh, so the, the immediate consequences are uh, the, the turrets start shooting at you because they, they identify you as a, uh, some alien material. Um, and uh, yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, that's for <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I would like to extend, please, a huge thank you to uh, Kane and Bethesda for, um, for coming out here tonight. And can we please have a huge round of applause for Raphael and Thank Mick. you. And for our panellists, Angela and Alex. Thank you all for coming along and we hope you to see you here at Acme soon again in the future. Thank you. And it's my first time in Australia and it's really awesome. So I'm really, I'm really happy. Right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>